Lesson 4 for January 20 to 26 for teaching on the 27th of January. Escape from the World's Ways. Sabbath afternoon, January 20. Before we start, let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we're about to open your word again this week. And as we do so, we give ourselves to you. We open our hearts. We pray that your Holy Spirit will speak to us from the words that are written in the Bible. We pray too that as we think on these things, as your mind influences our mind, that we may be changed to become more like you in the way we live, the way we act, and the way we relate to people. We pray in Jesus' dear name. Amen. Our memory text today is Proverbs chapter 11 and verse 4 and verse 28. Riches do not profit in the day of wrath, but righteousness delivers from death. He who trusts in his riches will fall, but the righteous will flourish like foliage. Let's read that again, Proverbs 11 and verse 4. Riches do not profit in the day of wrath, but righteousness delivers from death. He who trusts in his riches will fall, but the righteous will flourish like foliage. Although Satan failed with Jesus, he has succeeded with everyone else. He will continue to do so unless we fight in the armour and power of God, who alone offers us the freedom from the lure of the world. Thus, we focus our attention on our heavenly provider. David realised true value in this life when he wrote, in Psalm 34, verse 10, The lions will grow weak and hungry, but those who seek the Lord lack no good thing. Solomon recognised that wisdom and understanding were more valuable than silver or gold, as he expressed in Proverbs chapter 3. True happiness and right living come from turning our eyes from the possessions we own and looking to the living Christ who owns us. Our only hope to escape the allure of the world is a vital and successful relationship with Jesus. This week, we will study the elements of that relationship and how crucial it is for our own spiritual success to recognise the power behind the mask of the world and see the importance of Christ as the real reason for living. Sunday, January 21. A Relationship with Christ Love of worldly possessions, even by those who don't have much, can be a powerful chain that binds the soul to the world instead of to Christ. Even if we don't have much in terms of earthly possessions, the passionate desire to attain material goods can become a terrible curse that will, if not brought under the control of the Lord, lead a soul away from salvation. Satan knows this, which is why he uses the love of material possessions to ensnare as many as he possibly can. What is our only protection? Question. Set your mind on things above, not on things on the earth, it says in Colossians 3. How do we do what Paul tells us to do? Let's read Colossians 3, 2 again, set your mind on things above, not on things on the earth. And Psalm 119, 11, your word I have hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. Ephesians 6, verse 18, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. Another question. What other texts can you find that talk about what we should be keeping our mind focused on? For example, Philippians chapter 4, verse 8. Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, 
if there is any virtue and if there is anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. The only cure for worldliness, in whatever form it comes, is a continual devotion to Christ. Psalm 34 verse 1 reads, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. Moses regarded disgrace for the sake of Christ as of greater value than the treasures of Egypt, it said in Hebrews 11.24. Before any other relationship, Christ must be our first priority. Christ is looking for a commitment based on conviction, not on preference. That is, we must be devoted to Christ because of who He is and what He has done for us, not because of any immediate advantages our faith and commitment to Him might bring. Our lives are to be hidden in Jesus, and His plans are to be our plans. True commitment is putting our hand to the plough without, as it says in Luke 9.62, looking back. When we make that kind of commitment... Jesus elevates us to our full potential. When we surrender to him, he will break the world's hold upon our souls. We must become Christ-centred instead of stuff-centred. That alone will fill the void in our lives. And so to finish today, think about a time you acquired a material possession, something that you really wanted badly. How long did the joy and fulfilment last before it faded away and you were right back where you started. Monday, January 22, In the Word more than six million Bibles have been distributed worldwide, but how many are viewed as the word of the living God? How many are read with a sincere heart, open to know truth? Proper Bible study directs our spiritual compass and enables us to navigate a world of falsehood and confusion. The Bible is a living document of divine origin, as it says in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12, and as such it points us to truths that we cannot get anywhere else. The Bible is Christ's roadmap for daily living, and it educates us by expanding our intellect and refining our characters. Question. Read John chapter 5, verse 39, 14, verse 6, and 20, verse 31. The Bible, specifically the Gospels, gives us our most authoritative information about Jesus. What did these specific texts in John say about him, and why is he so important to us and to all that we believe? John 5, 39. You search the Scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, and these are they which testify of me. John 14, verse 6, Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And John 20, verse 31, But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life in his name. We study the Bible because it's the ultimate source of the truth. Jesus is the truth. And in the Bible we find Jesus as we can know him because of how he has been revealed to us there. Here, in God's Word, the Old and New Testaments, we learn about who Jesus is and what he has accomplished for us. We then fall in love with him and commit our souls and lives to his eternal safekeeping. By following Jesus and obeying his words, as revealed in his word, we become free from the bonds of sin and of the world. Therefore, if the Son makes you free, you shall be free indeed, as it says in John 8.34. Question. Read Romans chapter 4, verses 5 and 6. What are we being warned against here? And... How can the study of the Word of God help us in this struggle over our minds? Romans 8, beginning at verse 5. 
For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. The love of the world, especially the love of worldly possessions, can easily draw us away from God if we are not careful. That's why we must keep ourselves in the Word, which points us to the eternal and spiritual realities that are so crucial for the Christian life. Love of worldly things never elevates the mind to spiritual morality. Instead, it replaces biblical principles with greed, selfishness and lust. Love, as revealed in the Bible, builds relationships by teaching us the importance of the giving of ourselves to others. In contrast, worldliness is all about getting things for ourselves, which is the opposite of everything Jesus represents. Tuesday, January 23, The Life of Prayer And this is life eternal, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. John 17, verse 3 It is no wonder that Christians often say that their faith is about a relationship with God. If knowing God is eternal life, then we can find that life through a relationship with Him. And of course, central to that relationship is communication. We saw yesterday that God communicates to us through His divine Word. We, in turn, communicate with Him through prayer. If, as we have seen, we are to set our minds and hearts upon heavenly things as opposed to things of this world, then prayer is essential. This is because, by its very nature, prayer points us to a higher realm than that of the world itself. Yet even here, we must be careful because sometimes our prayers can be merely an expression of our own selfish nature. That's why we need to pray in submission to the will of God. Years ago, a woman sang these words, O Lord, won't you buy me a Mercedes-Benz? It was, in her own way, an attack on the materialism of those who profess faith in God. We, too, must be sure that when we pray, which is in itself an act of submission to God and death to the world, that we are seeking God's will, not just our own. Question. Read Hebrews chapter 11, verses 1 through to 6. What is the crucial component that must be mingled with our prayers? Also, what does it mean to come to God in faith and to pray in faith? Hebrews 11, beginning at verse 1. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For by it the elders obtained a good testimony. By faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that the things which are seen were not made of things which are visible. By faith Abel offered to God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, through which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and through it he being dead still speaks. By faith Enoch was taken away so that he did not see death, and was not found because God had taken him. For before he was taken, he had this testimony that he pleased God. But without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. If there is no faith attached to our prayers, there will be presumption. Satan's counterfeit faith. Ellen White writes in Prayer, page 57, Prayer and faith are closely allied, and they need to be studied together. 
In the prayer of faith there is a divine science. It is a science that everyone who would make his life work a success must understand. Christ says, What things soever ye desire, when ye pray, believe that ye receive them, and ye shall have them. Mark 11.24 He makes it plain that our asking must be according to God's will. We must ask for the things that He has promised, and whatever we receive must be used in doing His will. The conditions met, the promise is unequivocal. And so to finish the day, look at your own prayer life. What do you pray for? What do your prayers tell about your priorities? What other things might you need to be praying for? Wednesday, January 24, The Life of Wisdom One of the most beautiful stories in the Bible is found in the story of Solomon's request to God to give him, above all things, an understanding heart to judge your people, that I may discern between good and evil. For who is able to judge this great people of yours? 1 Kings chapter 3 and verse 9 question, what important words did God say to Solomon that, had he heeded, would have spared the king the ruin that his possessions brought upon him? Why was what God said to him so important for all of us? 1 Kings chapter 3 verse 14. So if you walk in my ways to keep my statutes and my commandments as your father David walked, then I will lengthen your days. And First John chapter 5, verse 3 says, For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. And First Peter 4, verse 17, For the time has come for judgment to begin at the house of God. And if it begins with us first, what will be the end of those who do not obey the gospel of God? Solomon had great wisdom, but wisdom in and of itself, if not acted upon and lived out, becomes nothing more than good information. In the biblical sense of the word, wisdom not acted upon is not truly wisdom. Many will be lost who will have had plenty of correct information about God and his requirements. But Solomon's lack of obedience caused him to stray from the paths to which the Lord had called him. Only later in life did he truly come to his senses, writing in humility, For wisdom is better than rubies, and all the things one may desire cannot be compared with her. Proverbs 8 verse 11 Wisdom is the application of knowledge and understanding. Knowledge represents the facts, understanding represents discernment, and wisdom comes in the process of applying our understanding and knowledge to our lives. A wise steward needs not only knowledge and understanding, but also the experience that comes from living out that knowledge and understanding. Solomon's example shows us how easily even the wisest and most understanding of people can get swept up in the emptiness of a materialist lifestyle if that person doesn't live out the knowledge that he or she has been given. And so to finish today, compare 1 Corinthians 3.19 and Proverbs 24.13 and 14. What is the difference between the two kinds of wisdom talked about in these texts? Share your answers with the class on Sabbath. First of all, 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 19. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God, for it is written, He catches the wise in their own craftiness. And Proverbs 24 verses 13 and 14. My son, eat honey because it is good, and the honeycomb which is sweet to your taste so shall the knowledge of wisdom be to your soul. If you have found it, there is a prospect, and your hope will not be cut off.
Thursday, January 25. The Holy Spirit. The great controversy is real. Two sides are battling for our souls. One is drawing us to Christ. John 6.44 tells us that no one can come to me unless the Father who sends me draws him and I will raise him up at the last day. And one to the world, as 1 John 2.16 says. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. The power of the Holy Spirit in our lives can and will draw us in the right direction, if we only will submit to Him. John 16.13 reads, however, when He, the Spirit of truth, has come, He will guide us into all truth. John 14 verse 16 reads, And I will pray the Father, and he will give you another helper, that he may abide with you for ever. The Holy Spirit empowers us to live by principle and by faith, not by whims or emotions that so dominate the world. Successful preparation for living in heaven comes by living faithfully in this world under the direction of the Holy Spirit. Paul counsels, your faith should not be in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God, in 1 Corinthians 2.5. The lure of the world, often through material possessions, draws us away from the Lord. In contrast, if we do not resist, the power of the Holy Spirit will pull us toward Jesus. Question. Success in the battle with the world and its lures will be accomplished only from outside of ourselves. Read Ezekiel 36, 26 and 27, John 14, 26 and Ephesians 3, 16 and 17. When we let the Holy Spirit take possession of us, what things will God do to ensure that we have spiritual victory? Ezekiel 36, verses 26 and 27, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes, and you will keep my judgments and do them. John 14, 26 reads, But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things, and bring to your remembrance all things that I said to you. And Ephesians three sixteen and 17, That he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might through his Spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love. Ellen White writes in The Desire of Ages, page 671, It is through false theories and traditions that Satan gains his power over the mind. By directing men to false standards, he misshapes the character. Through the scriptures, the Holy Spirit speaks to the mind and impresses truth upon the heart. Thus, he exposes error and expels it from the soul. It is by the Spirit of truth, working through the Word of God, that Christ subdues his chosen people to himself. End of quote. The Holy Spirit is the reporter of truth and is the ultimate gift that Jesus could give to represent the deity on earth after his ascension. The Holy Spirit strives to give us power to overcome the powerful lure of the world and its charms. And so to finish today, the world does pull at us all, doesn't it? What choices can you make right now that can help you surrender to the Holy Spirit who alone can give you power to resist the world's temptations. Friday, January 26. A steward operates from the twin principles of duty and love. Ellen White writes in Testimonies to the Church, Volume 4, page 62, Remember that duty has a twin sister, love. These united can accomplish almost everything, but separated 
neither is capable of good. End of quote. Duty is love in action. We need only to dwell on Christ's sacrifice in order for love to awaken our duty. In contrast are the principles of the world, hate and its twin, rebellion. Rebellion can be hate in action. Lucifer rebelled against God and will never stop doing so until he is destroyed. Ezekiel twenty eight sixteen and 17 By the abundance of your trading you became filled with violence within and you sinned. Therefore I cast you as a profane thing out of the mountain of God and I destroyed you, O covering cherub, from the midst of the fiery stones. Your heart was lifted up because of your beauty. You corrupted your wisdom for the sake of your splendor. I cast you to the ground. I laid you before kings that they might gaze at you. He turned the authority of love into the love of authority. The religious leaders in Israel hated the authority and power Jesus possessed, as we read in Matthew 22, 29. Jesus answered and said to them, You are mistaken, not knowing the scriptures nor the power of of God. Even when they fled the temple or withdrew from his piercing gaze, they did not change their ways. And that brings us to our four, five discussion questions this week. One, dwell more on this idea of love and duty. What does Ellen White mean when, after calling them twins, she says that one without the other is not capable of good? What does love look like without duty? And what does duty look like without love? Why must they both be together? 2. The memory verse for this week reads, Riches do not profit in the day of wrath, but righteousness delivers from death. He who trusts in his riches will fall, but the righteous will flourish like foliage. What is the meaning of this text? What is it saying about riches? And what is it not saying? 3. In class, discuss the life of Solomon. Ask how he could have gone so far off track. Look through the book of Ecclesiastes for texts that help reveal the futility and emptiness of worldly possessions, even when we have, like Solomon, so many of them. What have we learnt this week about prayer, about Bible study, and about a relationship with Christ that can keep us on the right track spiritually? 4. How can people who do not have a lot of worldly possessions nevertheless still be caught in the trap that Satan sets for them? And 5. What answer did you come up with in response to Wednesday's final question about the different kinds of wisdom? Inside Story Our mission story this week is titled Angel Carries Concrete Blocks by Andrew McChesney of Adventist Mission. Vladimir Moskalenko nudged his wife Galina awake in the sleepy Ukrainian town of Buzki. He had an unusual dream to share. I was standing with concrete blocks in my hands, he said. They were so heavy. Then suddenly an enormous, beautiful, shining angel stood before me. He smiled at me, and he put his hands on mine, carrying the concrete, and raised them up. Galina Moskalenko sat up. She had been praying for 5,000 US dollars to pay for concrete blocks to be used to transform an abandoned building into a Seventh-day Adventist church in their town of 1,400 people. Listen, some kind of financial help is on its way, Moskalenko said. I don't know where it will come from, but it will come. Two days later, a church member called and said, Three friends are visiting here from Poland. Here comes our money, Moskalenko told her husband. On Sabbath, the Polish visitors listened to Moskalenko's sermon. After sundown, she told them about the debt. 
A bank transfer of $5,000 arrived several days later. The gleaming Bosky Church, which opened in 2016 after 11 years of construction, was built on prayer and miracles, Moskolenko said. An Adventist couple from Australia provided $2,000 for a new roof. The Euro-Asia Division and the local conference provided mission funds. U.S. and Czech church members also contributed. God and his angels intervened repeatedly, said Moskalenko, 54 years old. She told of a bureaucratic showdown after local authorities rejected a request to knock a hole in a wall to create a second window. I prayed about it and thought, God, please help us knock a hole in the wall, she said. Then something interesting happened. We started to repair the one existing window and a crack formed in the wall, she said. The whole wall was going to collapse. Our construction workers quickly brought in a tractor with something to support the wall, but as they worked to prop up the wall, it collapsed as if an angel had said, There you go, Moskalenko said, flicking a finger in the air. That, she said, is what happens when you do your best and trust in God. He accomplishes the impossible. This lesson was read by Dr. Percy Harrell. It was recorded in the studios of Christian Services for the Blind. This podcast is brought to you by the Savile School Department and through the services of Hope Channel.